Hello guys, welcome back to another exciting edition of Sunday Frog Radio. I'm Froggy Frog 9000. Thanks for joining me. And there goes my engine. Gee, that's no good. Might have to, might have to start again. Where did that come from? There's some triple A over there. Gee, I'll probably be alright if I hurry up. It's August the 26, 2018. Going to discuss many topics today, starting off with the the most mundane and getting on towards the most dramatic at the end. First topic is the DJI Mavic 2. Uh, I've started to recently started to follow drone development, technological development. Let's see if we can get this plane off the ground. By the way, I'm under fire. I'm under fire from Akak. Uh, DJI. <coughs> The leading consumer drone company has released a new drone. It's the DJI Mavic 2. <coughs> it's um, in Australia. It's there's two versions. One of them's around two thousand is two thousand dollars, and the other one's two thousand three hundred dollars. Jeez, this is a heavy plane. Got some akak over there. And I got some trees there. This is not looking good try and get between the trees not looking good looking good looking good and we've made it into the air let's get that gear up let's get that gear up geez that was a close call <coughs> so DJI Mav Mavic DJI is the company that makes the they're like the Apple of drones like they make sort of high quality consumer product drones in fact you can even buy DJI drones at Apple stores <coughs> as I say there's two versions one of them it has a high quality Hasselblad uh, image sensor that's like a one inch image sensor the physical area is one inch and um, compare and contrast that to the other one which doesn't have the one inch Hasselblad Hasselblad's a high quality camera company so the other version doesn't have that but it does have a zoom it has a two times optical zoom so we're talking about the differences between the cameras the, the Hasselblad camera is um, kind of it's not state nothing state-of-the-art like you want to spend 15 grand then you can get state-of-the-art sort of thing you want to spend 10 million dollars then you can get state-of-the-art but as far as consumer drone consumer drones go the Hasselblad optics is state-of-the-art, I'd call it that. The The other version, it's exactly the same drone, but the camera is less good, but it does have a benefit that it has a... There's one of our guys crashed down there. It, it does have a uh, two-times optical zoom, and the difference in price, the one with the two-times optical zoom and the less good camera is um, two grand Australian, and the one with the Hasselblad camera is 2300 but it doesn't have a zoom and we're talking filming in 4k and things like that that was a bit of a guess there we'll see how we go that was way off and he got me the bastard so that's the DJI Mavic 2 geez those AA's are deadly and I'm think I'm mentioning all this because I'm I'm generally speaking I'm interested in aviation and that's sort of related to that and I'm interested in photography and videography uh, and that that sort of brings me to my the nexus or whatever the the main takeaway point is that using video games I can make fantastic photography that is increasingly a pretty good approximation of photorealistic graphics in highly dangerous situations like flying a kitty hawk in in combat with um akak like like this without any kind of it's it's a breeze but um in the real world when you're flying drones there's all sorts of limitations firstly you're not really allowed to use a drone anywhere so i'm tossing up the idea of get any anywhere that's interesting and furthermore in Australia there's no there's not really any interesting places to use a drone we just got desert and and ocean and that's about it compare and contrast that to 
uh, to Europe where they've, there's just thousands of castles assuming that if you're allowed to film a castle if I was in Europe I'd get one of those latest drones in a heartbeat and I'd go and film every one of the castles in my area that I could that I could reach because wouldn't that be interesting to see castles close up essentially from a bird's eye perspective some areas of the castle that are inaccessible to humans wouldn't have been touched in probably hundreds of years wouldn't have been seen by human eyes in hundreds of years perhaps even uh, a thousand years and and that sort of thing so um but there's nothing like that where i am we really don't have much at all in terms of drone uh, compatible geographical features we do have some kind of rock formations and that but they're all in national parks and it's my understanding that you can't use a drone currently in national parks so all of these kinds of factors the geographical location and the the other things they they add up to at least to me at this stage to the to the bottom line that I'm not going to get a drone because I, I can't adequately use it I mean uh, imagine imagine being in um, uh, imagine being in Egypt and filming the pyramids flying a drone up to the top of the pyramids and filming or on the top of the sphinx uh, apparently there's a trapdoor on the top of the sphinx's head and that seems like an ideal project for a drone to fly a drone up there and see what the top of the sphinx's head looks like and if there is a trapdoor there I, I imagine that that's not allowed either so that's my synopsis of drones at this time uh, so that's that how am I going with this plane it seems like the engine's been damaged because of all that combat we've got some snow mountains over there I'm flying in Kuban in the summer and this plane is struggling to stay airborne I think the engine's not producing 100% power so I'd better stop nattering on and get the rest of Frog Radio completed before this plane ditches we have some uh, we have some exciting news in both IL-2 and DCS I'll cover the cover the uh, cover the DCS news so I was looking at I was looking at the DCS weekend news uh, and lo and behold there's some amazing pictures there which I'll put on the screen now of uh, a bloody mosquito they've got a mosquito there like I was blown away I, I had heard rumors that a mosquito was in development so DCS has got a mosquito in development they've got some pictures there of it and also some amazing pictures as well of a P47 Again, I'd heard rumours of P-47. I think I'd seen some interior sort of cockpit shots that they were doing, but there it is. So DCS is moving well and truly into the World War II sphere of things uh, with their Mosquito, their P-47. And they've mentioned a JU-88, and uh, I think they mentioned an A-20. So there's a few planes that they're working on honestly can't wait to fly the Mosquito that's going to be amazing and the P-47 for that matter and as as I've as I've reported on in the past uh, IL-2 is making a P-47D Thunderbolt uh, as we speak and um, I've reported on that in previous Frog Radios and here's a screenshot of it as well so the other DCS news, there's a SCUD as well, they've made a SCUD, SCUD missile launcher from 1990s Gulf War era uh, period. DCS is going to have a helicopter sail, I believe it starts on the 5th of September, so what's that, about 10 days away, and it ends at the end of September, 30th of September, and it's around 70 US dollars, and for that you get four choppers, I'm trying to remember what they were, there's there's the successor to the Mil 4, the Mil 8. Um, they got some colloquial name for it. Um, like the, I can't remember what it is, the green, the green Wonder or something. Anyways, it's an Mil-8, and it's it's a kind of a workhorse helicopter, military helicopter, and um, they've got the Huey Bell UH-1 or whatever it is, the Huey iconic vietnam era chopper and they've got the i think the aerospatial squirrel as350b is it a squirrel 
or an al alouette. <coughs> alouette, maybe it's an alouette. It's a French chopper, I'm certain of that anyways. They've got a French chopper. And what else do they have? Oh yeah, and the, the um, contra-rotating bladed um, alligator, I think it's called. Alligator, the one with the two main rotors that are contra-rotating. Anyways, you can get those four choppers starting, I think, September the 5th, going all through September for uh, $70 US roughly. So that's some interesting news. I'm tempted to pull the trigger on that, except I um I don't have very much time as it is, uh, even to play, even to fly the existing planes that I already have, and uh, I, I struggle to fly the F-18 and and the Spitfire in DCS. I just don't have very much time as it is, and if I was to buy more things, I, I'm afraid that I would probably not get full value out of them. But I'm still tempted to buy it anyway even if I get to play it for five minutes per month. So that that's the news for um that's the news for DCS. And some really exciting news for Isle 2 Sturmovic Great Battles series, particularly Battle of Bowden Platt. And I'll put I'll put the pri I'll let me start again. I'll put the pictures up on the screen. They've uh, the the developer diary has released some pictures of the ME two six two, just um, without a skin on it at the moment. But yeah, it looks amazing. I mean, that's a 262, all right. And they've released, uh, and it's got R4M rockets underwing. So there's our first glimpse of the ME262 in Battle of Bowden Platt. And that's going to be one of the highlights of my sim career is to fly the 262. That'll be so amazing. Uh, they've also released some P47 shots. Um, which I've shown before. They've they've released some imagery of the Sherman, the Sherman tank. So as part, I guess, as part of tank crew or as part of boat and plat. Not sure which, maybe both. And they've mentioned in the developer diary, developer blog, that they're working on a comp compressibility model for the ME262 because it's going to be getting up towards transonic, supersonic speed. And so they need to add to the sim engine, the to the physics engine or what have you. They need to add the um, the ability to demonstrate compressibility when an aircraft approaches the speed of sound. You, you get certain uh, aerodynamic attributes, get wing wing buffeting, and um, I think if you go far enough towards the speed of sound, you might get a shock stall, where the aeroplane basically is doing around 980 kilometers an hour depending on the altitude and the temperature and it shock stalls and that means it suddenly tilts nose down and basically disintegrates <laughs> so that's a shock stall it's kind of like a worst case scenario for a non-supersonic aerodynamics aircraft You're getting close to the speed of sound and and um, stalling abruptly at a thousand kilometers an hour and at that speed the air, although we think of air as being thin, at that speed the air is like concrete and it totally smashes the plane to bits. That's a shock stall uh, near the speed of sound and that's something to do with um, aerodyna uh, supersonic aerodynamics um, for aircraft that are not necessarily designed to fly supersonic. I am sort of nattering on here a bit aren't I? Um, so that's the compressibility model in IL-2 Great Battle Series for the 262. So don't those pictures look amazing? That's all pretty exciting. <coughs> um, and uh, it, if you visited my website, you'll see that I've got a new picture up on the banner. Uh, I had a P40 there. I had my banner art there for ages, which remained, and then I put in a P40 in US colours, and then I put in a P40 in British colours, British livery and that is a particular plane that really existed it's um, it's it's my effort uh, to reproduce uh, a P-40 that crashed in the desert 70 odd years ago and was discovered only about I think about six years ago by a Polish oil explora exploration team uh, this is in the Sahara Desert really, I think it's the Sahara, really way out in the, in the proper desert, 
and um, there's a whole there's a whole backstory to that aircraft. Basically, it was a it was a damaged aircraft. It was being ferried to a place where it could be further repaired in in or around Egypt. And um, let me let me just run through some details that I've got that I have here. So it was on the 28th of June 1942. It was an aircraft of number two number two six zero squadron. It was a P forty Kitty Hawk Mark three. The serial number was ET five seven four, and and HS dash B. And it was flown by Flight Sergeant Dennis Copping. It was a ferry flight. The location was Al Wadi Al Jadid in Egypt and uh, the pilot was aged 24 and he, w he went missing. Uh, I believe it was 2012 that the aircraft was first discovered and I mean it had just been sitting there. No one, not even Bedouin, had come across it. You know, it was totally untouched except for the sand that had been scraping the paint off of the wings and that was about it. It was probably buried under sand for a good bulk of that time. A sandstorm can reveal something that's hidden under the sand. So the aircraft was flying along uh, with it, with the undercarriage down and that's why it was being ferried in part is because the undercarriage refused to retract. There's not actually much information about the situation. It just sort of got swallowed up by the enormity of World War II and forgotten until it was discovered. I've, I've always been interested in that particular aircraft. It's sort of a... I don't know... Um, I don't, I don't really know how to how to describe it. It's sort of a an archetypal World War Two desert story. It's sort of if you want to put it in movie terms, I'm thinking the English Patient, and I'm thinking Roald Dahl's book Going Solo, where he describes being given the wrong coordinates and flying out to no man's land between the British and Italian lines with the wrong coordinates and running out of fuel and crash landing his Gloucester Gladiator in the desert and uh, and nearly nearly perishing and somehow making it back. It sort of reminds me of Roald Dahl's situation there. Luckily Roald Dahl survived to, to go on to write all of his fantastic books. But um, yeah, that as soon as I saw in the news the pictures of that aircraft crashed in the desert that really caught my interest all those years ago I think it was 2012 and so uh, and I've always I've always been interested in in discovering crashed World War II aircraft in the jungle or in the desert and what have you um, and they're they're extremely rare these days extremely rare and often they don't get the right treatment um, many people just see them as aluminium scrap the same as an aluminium can uh, to me it's the opposite of that they're amazing pieces of real life history that need to be discovered and preserved and kept in an, as original condition as possible So, um, not to HSB, not to be the Kitty Hawk HSB, not to be confused with the later Kitty Hawk called HSB that replaced the crashed original HSB, which was a the replacement was a different model of Kitty Hawk, and there's an interesting aspect to that in that uh, Canadian Ace, and I'll just read you some details here. Stocky Edwards, James Francis Edwards, flew. Kitty Hawk HSB, the second one, uh, and he was a he was a Canadian fighter pilot during World War Two with 19 confirmed aerial victories, Canada's highest scoring ace in the Western Desert campaign. So that's that's an, an added piece of um, 
really interesting history about HSB that I didn't even know. So just to try and, because that's a bit hard to follow, just to try and recap that for you. There were two HSBs and, and they were both P40s, but one of them was the older model P40 and the other one was the newer model P40. You can tell the newer model because the tail has a different leading edge to it. Um, it's more sort of extended and sloped. So um, the original HSB, it's, it, it had technical issues. Its undercarriage would not retract. And so it was on a ferry flight. Uh, it was on a ferry flight and it crashed in the desert and it wasn't discovered until 70 odd years later, I believe in 2012, by a Polish oil exploration team. Uh, when the original HSB went missing, they replaced it with a newer model P40. Uh, and at some point, it's confirmed at some point, uh, the Canadian ace with 19 aerial victories, Stocky Edwards, flew the replacement P40 at some point in his career. So this is all amazing stuff to me. This is amazing history to me. And um, so so using, uh, using Adobe Illustrator software, I've recreated uh, to the best of my ability um, a skin for, for my P40 profile art which as much as, as I can possibly make it um, is, is an exact an exact copy an exact uh, replica of the original HSB um, ET574 that crashed in the desert whose, whose pictures I've been showing on the screen here and um, all of this, all of this has significance to me. I don't know about you, but um, it's yeah, it's something that's um, something that I almost get a bit emotional about. Actually, all of this stuff, um, it's very dramatic. Crashing in the desert and never being seen of, seen again um, until someone stumbles upon them, and and then. There, there's an added drama to all of this that um, so it's a it's a British aircraft so you would have thought that it would go back to, to like the British Museum the British War Museum or what have you but it ended up in Egypt on display outdoors uh, with a new paint job that had a shark's mouth on it and the original HSB didn't have a shark's mouth on it and the RAF Roundel was a on the smaller side it was the wrong there are many different versions of the RAF round L the one that you you can see on my profile art is the A1 RAF round L used in a specific period and HSB the original had that round L the Egyptians they've painted the wrong round L on the aircraft on the actual aircraft and they've painted a shark's mouth onto it um, so to me that's that's disappointing and even even more so that they're keeping it outdoors it shouldn't be outdoors it should be preserved in museum conditions and they shouldn't have they shouldn't have um, done anything with the undercarriage or anything like that um, they've really botched it furthermore to that apparent I don't know the details more than just what I've read on the internet same as anyone but apparently uh, the British one of the British museums I guess it's the the war war museum or what have you tried to get hold of the aircraft and in doing so completely botched the deal and somehow gave away a Spitfire that they had in their collection which it said in the news article was worth 500,000 pounds let me tell you a Spitfire is worth much more than 500,000 pounds we're probably talking about fire uh, uh, five million dollars whatever that is in pounds uh 1.5 million pounds minimum i would say they're, they're getting more and more expensive in any condition and to some people such as myself they're more or less priceless uh priceless so anyways the this museum in in britain it somehow relinquished like gave away 
gave away a Spitfire with the understanding that they'd be able to secure the P-40. And so this museum's had a net loss. It's given away the Spitfire and it hasn't gotten the P-40 and the P-40's been destroyed, kind of. Um, and it's sitting outdoors uh, far from home, you could, you could say. Furthermore, there's the issue that that um, I don't want to be too harsh on the Egyptians, but bloody hell, from from what I've read online, they're they're not really doing anything with the remains of of uh, of Dennis coping, and they're not they're even refusing to confirm whether it's him or not which they could easily do, I believe, with a DNA test. But they've, they've, according to what I've read online, I should say allegedly, the Egyptians are, are refusing to confirm the DNA results of the, um, of the, of the remains. And they're citing that the DNAs, that the bones are too washed out or something along those lines, so they can't get the DNA, which to me sounds like an excuse because they get D they get DNA of people that are like ten thousand years old that they pull out of swamps, or that they find mummified for that matter in the desert for that matter, and so some some remains that have uh, from a physiological point of view some remains that have been in the desert for a blink of an eye seventy years should be easily identifiable by modern DNA techniques. So this is a really sad situation. It's bittersweet. I hope that this is not the end of the story. It's good that the P-40's been discovered. It's good that there's some international news about it. But it's bad that it's languishing in the current state. And it's even worse that the pilot hasn't been given uh, a, a full military uh, burial, which, which is what would be fitting in, in this circumstance. So that's that. Um, you can, onto the commercial side of things, you can buy my profile art in garment format. It's on t-shirts, it's on sweaters, jumpers, long sleeve t-shirts, hoodies. Uh, you, can, you can buy it from Amazon if you're in the United States. And soon, I don't know exactly when, but soon enough, you'll be able to buy my, my clothing line which is called T-Shirt Frog in Germany and in the United Kingdom as well. At the moment, it's limited to addresses in the United States, but soon you'll be able to buy my garments if you're in the UK and Germany. So um, that's me rambling ad lib about this subject that I'm fairly passionate about. Um, I hope that makes some sense to you. So that's that, and that's the end of Frog Radio for another Sunday. I'll see you next uh, Sunday. Thanks for listening, and uh, bye for now.